you have any questions or any problems with it or anything like that, just shoot us a note at info at tinder.co. And uh, thanks very much. Awesome. Thanks. That looks really great. I can't wait to try it on my uh, BlackBerry. <laughs> I do still have a BlackBerry. Uh, one important announcement. If you are Thomas J. Uh, Scottrich Jr., S C H O R I S C H Jr., any ideas on how to pronounce that? Anyways, um, you've lost something important. Important. Come see me afterwards. Okay? Uh, oh, and your lights are on. Sorry. Um, okay, so let's keep on moving here. Um, so I want to bring up, uh, of course, our, our star speaker, the guy who created Scala. Let's bring up Martin Odersky uh, to start, start us off with something really special. So let's give him a hand. Thank you. Wow, this is really amazing. Uh, so it's my fourth Scala day, so I'm one of the four <laughs> persons. And we have been to great venues every time, every time bigger than the, four, uh, than the, the, than the one before. We've been at Lausanne and then at Stanford University. So Kunle Olokotun, the organizer, is actually here. Then we've been in London and now here. But I, I think it's fair to say that I've never been at something as impressive as a venue as this one here. So uh, thanks to the organizers, particularly Sushila and James, for picking it and making it all happen. That's Now, before I launch into my talk, and you can all safely go to sleep, there's one thing that is uh, much more important and that I wanted to do first. Uh, Scala really is the community. That's what makes it happen. That's what drives it. And I believe there are a few people who are key to the community. And one of the people who was absolutely key as much as everyone else, uh, anyone else, was Phil Bagwell. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to have an award in memory and honor of uh, Phil Bagwell for outstanding contributions to the community. And I'm very happy to say that this year's award is for Dick Wall, who uh, I guess all of you know and I think who has been really the soul uh, of uh, Scala and uh, the Scala environment, in particular with his... Uh, uh, with his emphasis on being open, on being friendly to newcomers, and on, on being inclusive. So, Dick, please. <laughs> ah, here we are. Yeah. So, 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 I have the pleasure to give you this plaque, which says, in honor of the late Phil Bagwell's passion, enthusiasm, and dedication to the Scala community. Thank you very much. And, and you get a watch, uh, which is uh, also something special because it's a high altitude watch. So you can go very high up in the stratosphere Thank with you. it. And uh, you have to know that Phil, his favorite hobby was uh, piloting gliders. So he would love to stay up in the air forever. And uh, the watch is just the right watch for that. So not necessarily that you have to do it, but uh, oh, if, you, if, you are, if you want I'll, to do it, then I'll be, uh, it's there I'll for be you. I'll making use of it. Have I got a minute to say? Of course. Oh, thank you. Um, okay, so first of all, thank you very much, um, Martin and uh, the TypeSafe people. This is super nice, and it's actually very touching that uh, it's in honor of Phil. Um, I just wanted to say, I, I, I've wanted to kind of share the first meeting that I had with, with Phil, which was somewhat similar to the meeting that I had with Martin, uh, in that I had absolutely no idea who I was talking to. Uh, and I was talking to this guy, and he was fantastically interesting. And I had a really, really interesting lunchtime conversation. Walked away, unlike Martin, walked away without ever knowing who I'd been talking to. Uh, and only later did I realize that it was the Phil Bagwell. Uh, I'd just never seen a picture of him before. Uh, and uh, I'll keep this short. Obviously, you guys want to get to the main act. But um, one of the things that really struck me about this and various other things that I've done over the years with uh, Java and Scala is I've met a lot of people. And one universal, well, maybe not universal, but one very, very high correlation is that the very best engineers that I've met have also been brilliant communicators. 
So if I would say anything about this in honor of uh, Phil and the other people that I've worked with over the years is next time you're picking out the technologies that you want to learn uh, on your next to-do list, consider leveling up on people skills as one of those. Just put it in the list and get better at communicating with people. It'll make you a better engineer, I promise. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so the um, title of my keynote is uh, Scala with Style, and I have to admit that I've very quite often already cursed the day I proposed this title, uh, because then I had to, to make a talk that follows the title, and I found it very, very difficult to come up with a talk, because style, after all, is such a personal matter. Everybody disagrees with that, uh, with, with, with each other's opinions, and it's very difficult to find something that in any way whatsoever is authoritative uh, that you can like put forward as a measure of style that the, uh, the community as a whole should follow. Uh, in Scala we have a particular problem for that and that is because I believe that we are at this sort of confluence of two paradigms, imperative, object-oriented, shifting towards functional and I think at the end there will be a fusion of the two. And Scala is in the middle of it. And because there are so many strands and influences in it, you have a mixture of possibilities that far exceeds uh, a usual programming language. You just have many, many more possible choices uh, that arise out of the fairly orthogonal combination of many, many, feet, many, many different dimensions, imperative, object-oriented, and functional. And the pro problem is then, well, how to... Uh, distill a style guide from that. Sometimes I really wished I was Guido von Rossum and I had done Python and there was one way to do it and that would be the end of the story. Scala, Scala is not this language, so, so we have to live with that and we have to uh, uh, cope with it and go forward nevertheless. Uh, it's not a bad thing uh, because it also means that it can be much more expressive and flexible and open than a language which essentially consists of a fixed recipe for most of the things that you do. So one thing that I wanted to uh, revisit uh, was go back in history because when we say that uh, we are now in the transition of functional, of imperative to functional programming, then uh, it might actually pay to see uh, what happened when object-oriented programming started. And I'm actually old enough to have been around uh, for that, not when it was, was created, that was before my time, but when it became mainstream, that was in the 80s. Uh, so uh, I remember that I've seen uh, in, I think it was 81 or 82, that this cover of Byte came out. Byte was, at the time, the premier magazine for developers. And I was fascinated by it. It was more than 100 pages that described small talk in all the detail, everything that had been done at Xerox Park. I was fascinated and also completely puzzled. I didn't understand a thing. Method, message, what, are, what, what were all these things? They didn't relate to anything that I was brought up with. Uh, now, uh, 30 years later, of course, all this is commonplace and object-oriented programming has been boring, uh, standard to the de de degree of being boring and enterprisey and, and, and reveled from, uh, from people who say, well, it's, it's essentially the stuff that, that all the bad programming practices came from object-oriented pro programming. But at the time, it was really the new thing and, and the very weird thing, pretty much like what functional programming is today. So uh, what do you think was the first popular object-oriented programming language? And I don't mean C++ by that. Uh, not, can be a little bit less popular than C++ was. So, so the first popular object-oriented programming language actually was Simula 67. So 67 was the year it came out, so quite early at that. Uh, what was the second? Well, the second I gave it away already, that was Smalltalk. So the second popular object-oriented pro programming language was Smalltalk. So why did object-oriented programming became popular? You could say, well, nowadays you have a zillion of books that uh, 
tell you about the virtues of object-oriented programming, about all the funny, fancy principles and software construction techniques and modelization advantages and so on. So you could say, well, maybe encapsulation was that the secret why object-oriented programming was popular. No, I don't think so. Was it maybe code reuse? Uh, no, I don't think so either. Dynamic binding, maybe indirectly, but uh, not, not really. Dependency inversion, that, came, that one came much, much later. Lisk of substitution principle, open-close principle. Now you've got to be kidding. <laughs> it was clearly because of the things you could do with object-oriented programming. There were certain things that you could do with object-oriented programming that you couldn't do before. So what was that? Well, if you look at a traditional application, like a linked list, then what you see that there are two cases uh, of data. There's empty lists and non-empty lists, and then there's a number of operations that you can do with lists, like map or reverse or print or get an LM or insert an LM and so on. And the important thing is that these operations, they're really unbounded. You can come up with a dozen more uh, in the next second, and it doesn't end there. On the other hand, the cases, what a list is, that's fixed. The list is either the empty list or it's a non-empty list, and then it consists of an element and the rest of the list. So that was the traditional way of looking at software. Now, if you look at the first uh, object or in programming language, Simula 67, so that was, as the name implies, for simulation, although it was a general purpose programming language. And in simulation, you didn't have that situation at all. What you had, rather, was that you had a fixed number of operations. So, for instance, your simulation would go through the next step. You could maybe display it in some way. You could form aggregates of certain uh, properties of the simulation. And then you had an unbounded number of implementations. You could simulate cars or roads or molecules or cells or persons or buildings or cities that, or anything else that you would care about. For Smalltalk, it was slightly different. Smalltalk wasn't a language for simulation. It was a language that was invented at the same time as the bitmap display and the Alto computer, and the new possibilities there was graphical user interfaces and, graph and their widgets. Uh, but the situation was quite similar to, simula to simulations, namely that you had a fixed number of operations that you could do with a GUI widget, namely redraw, resize, move, things like that, bounded rectangle. And again, you had an unbounded number of implementations. A GUI widget could be a window, menu, shape, a letter, a curve, an image, a video, and so on. Just get this up here. Whoops, sorry. So what the two uh, applications had in common then was that they both needed a way to execute a fixed API with an unknown implementation. And that wasn't before possible, or at least not very easily, not very simply. You could do it in a language such as C, but for anyone who has actually tried to do that, it was clear pretty quickly that this would be very painful. It wasn't that people didn't try. For instance, uh, in the end of the 80s, there was a program called the Presentation Manager that was for, of the IBM operating system OS2, the windowing system, and that wasn't written in an object-oriented language, and it made you essentially go through a lot of manual things to simulate sort of this dynamic dispatch and objects. It wasn't pretty, and maybe that was also one of the reasons why OS2 didn't win and Windows and Macintosh won in the end. So what does it have to do with functional programming? So I guess a lot of the people here in this room are convinced that functional programming has a lot of methodological advantages. Just like object-oriented programming was a step forward then, I think functional programming definitely is a big, big step forward now. I believe if you write functional programs, you will have fewer errors, you will have better modularity, you will have higher level abstractions, shorter code, increased developer productivity. But all these are, I believe, also not enough for mainstream adoption. Main, mainstream is something extremely difficult to move. It has a lot of inertia. Uh, and after all, an argument for that is, would be that with all these methodolog methodological advantages, functional programming, after all, has been around for 50 years now. It was sort of uh, more than 50 years. The first functional language was Lisp, invented around 1960. 
So what I believe is necessary is a catalyzer, something that sparks the initial adoption until the other advantages became clear to everyone. And in object-oriented pro programming's case, that was GUI widgets. And I believe in functional programming, the catalyzer is uh, essentially uh, distributed and uh, parallel programming, concurrent programming. And I believe it's driven by mostly hardware and economical uh, forces, the hardware forces that, as we all know, uh, we all have to go to multi-core to get uh, significant performance gains out of the processes. And furthermore, we are uh, running most of our applications in the cloud, which means that to get any sort of scalability, you won't, have, you won't necessarily run on bigger servers, you will run on more of them, and you will have to distribute your application over then dozens, hundreds, sometimes thousands of servers in a data center. And that new world has some very hard challenges. I can see at least three challenges there. The first one is uh, parallelism. How do you make actually use of all these multi-cores, these, these new CPUs that you have uh, in a single processor, in a GPU, in a cluster? Second one is once you distribute your net by necessity asynchronous and reactive, so how do you deal with asynchronous events? And finally, when you distribute things uh, over multiple sites, then you have the problem that some of these will go down uh, and you have the problem that some network connectivity will take a long time or will go down. So you have all the problems of distributed computing. And these are hard problems. Uh, the, and the issue here is that Mutable state is for each of these problems a big liability because it means that with mutable state you have to worry about cache coherence. Uh, you cannot simply cache things the last result because, well, somebody might have changed this, this thing on the other site and then you have to invalidate your caches. You worry about races and versioning and many other things more. So in this new world, the standard of yesterday, mutable state, is suddenly becoming a problem. And I believe that this is, I believe, the catalyzer that will move functional programming over the bump into mainstream adoption. So the essence of functional programming, just to state it here, uh, is that we want to concentrate on transformations of immutable values rather than the stepwise modifications of mutable state. It doesn't mean to say we will ban it outright. Sometimes there's certainly a role for mutable state, but uh, we, we do not want to use mutable state without a very, very good reason of doing that. So you could say, well, what about objects? Uh, well, should that go out as well with mutable state? So should we forget all we have learned about uh, object-oriented design analysis and so on? And I believe that's probably a bit premature if we do that. Uh, and I actually don't think that we will ever forget these lessons. Because I believe object-oriented programming is, has good answers for some very hard questions and some very fundamental questions. So the most fundamental qu question that I see object-oriented programming answering is simply what goes where. In the end, with a system of a couple hundred thousand lines or a million lines, you have to have some organization where you put things. And uh, uh, it's just not good enough to just put any, everything in the global namespace and assume that you will not have conflicts. Uh, in a system like that, they are essentially characterized by the fact that you don't even know that some ex components exist, never mind looking in the code. So how will you be able to avoid, let's say, name conflicts and, and other problems in uh, a global namespace? I think that simply won't fly. So once you started to say, well, okay, I need some organizations, I put things somewhere, then you want to make this composition mechanism as powerful and flexible as you can, and then you will find that you want essentially first-class modules, uh, and you want uh, some form of code reuse and inheritance, and you want dynamic dispatch, and then you have object-oriented programming back, uh, whether you call it OOP or a module system doesn't really matter. But I think one point is never the, the, the less very important that we will have a new view of objects, one which is quite different from what we had so far. 
So what did we have so far? So there's this phrase by Grady Booch which says that an object is characterized by its state, identity, and behavior. I think he actually was wrong or no longer up to date on two out of three counts here. So uh, the first one is state, uh, and with state I guess he and everybody meant mutable state. Well, uh, I very much doubt that. That's actually the, the kind of objects that typically cause us often problems. Sometimes we need them, but in most cases they're more trouble than it's worth. Uh, identity. Uh, do we really think it's a feature that to compare two strings with equals equals we get the object identity rather than comparing the strings by value? Is that something that we want to build our software on? I don't really think so. I would say, well, it's an accident, but it's definitely not a principle that we say all objects, the primary identity of objects should be reference identity. And finally, behavior, yes, absolutely. Objects encapsulate behavior, contain behavior, so that's what we want to concentrate on. And I believe that, for me, was pretty clear and uncontroversial, and I was actually quite surprised that I was last summer in a workshop with other uh, programming language designers, quite famous ones, some of them, and uh, it, uh, I actually met violent opposition of some of the main designers of object-oriented languages, which tells me, no, I'm totally wrong, and objects absolutely need state and identity. If they don't have that, it wouldn't be an object-oriented language. So there you see, sometimes not so simple. So the question is, can functional programming and object-oriented programming be combined? And in fact, it turns out that this is pretty much a cultural problem, not so much a technical problem, because how many people see OOP is pretty much like that, like the manager type looking over your cubicle and looking that you, that you, have, that you put the right factory or factory in place in your code base and things like that. And it goes both ways. So the way that uh, the mainstream industry sees function programming is often like that. The mad scientists were a little bit dangerous and they're definitely crazy and we want none of that stuff. And uh, that's a problem because I think we are pretty much in the middle here uh, between, between those two communities. And sometimes it's difficult to actually uh, have, have, a, have a good uh, uh, place to sit uh, between those communities. Sometimes we, uh, we, we tend to fall between uh, the two chairs here. So what we would prefer, of course, is sit comfortably in chairs and... Uh, lie back and be at the beach, uh, but I think to get there we need to work a little bit and get, get rid of, in particular, some baggage first, some baggage of previous conceptions in the two communities about each other, about what's important, and maybe also some baggage of complexity. So bridging the gap, I think uh, Scala is really at the forefront there to try to bridge that gap between function and object and programming, and to do this it sort of has to be orthogonal, expressive, and unopinionated because by bridging the, back, the gap, it means that you need to be very inclusive. You need to have a large span of possibilities that you can do. So you shouldn't be too closed-minded about enforcing exactly one way to do things. So Scala naturally adapts to many different programming styles, and that's good. But on the other hand, then the question is, okay, what style should I pick? Uh, without be risking to be just left up uh, here to hang high and dry uh, on the Brooklyn Bridge. So certainly Scala is not a better Java. That's definitely not what it is, and I believe it's also not a Haskell on the JVM. Uh, I think that's better left to no doubt forthcoming implementations of Haskell on new platforms. I very much like Haskell, but Scala is not the same language. So what is, is it then? So I think it's sort of something that will emerge. I think there will emerge a new fusion between function and object-oriented, just like in the end, object-oriented and procedural programming also sort of fused. It wasn't really an antagonism. Uh, object-oriented programming simply absorbed the procedure paradigm, and I think here we will sort of absorb the uh, core features of object-oriented programming into functional programming. So, uh, with that said, uh, we still need to pick a style. So, what I have to do now is give you a very personal point of view of some of the things I, I have been struggling with, where I said, well, uh, what kind of guidelines can we give 
Also, what kind of questions did I pose myself? Should I write things in this way and that way? How do you trade off, uh, do, do the trade-offs between things? So what I'm going to do is I give you just six general suggestions of what I think is good style guides, good, good, uh, gu good, good ideas to take with you when you program. And then I'm going to talk about six possible trade-offs one can make in one way or in another. So suggestions. The first one is really pretty obvious and pretty clear, but nevertheless, I think we have, I, I, I should say it, I think the most important one is always keep it simple. And uh, since I talk about simplicity, uh, I guess quite a few of you have seen uh, Rich Hickey's talk at Strange Loop last year. If you haven't, then you should. It actually explains very, very well what simplicity is and how it's different from Ease, ease of use, ease is familiarity, and simplicity really is the straight line. To go from A to B in a straight line without entangling a lot of different things uh, into one complex whole. So complexity means comes from complexing, and it has to do with essentially putting different concerns into a, a single thing and then having to manage too many different concerns. Simplicity means you can separate your concerns. Wherever you can do that, do that. And I couldn't say it better than what Rich Hickey did, so if you are unsure about this, then just look at his talk. So the second thing I want to say is uh, that naming is very, very important. So here's something that I believe you shouldn't do. So that's sometimes stuff that I see sometimes. Uh, so that's an expression, and well, uh, it's all very uh, uh, interesting what it does. Yeah. Well, hmm. <laughs> amazing what you can do in a single statement, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean that you have to do that. And I actually believe that, yeah, it's probably not, not a very good thing. Whenever I see code like that, I said, well, there must be a better way. So what, what would be a better way? So the better way is actually hard. That's why probably it wasn't done that way. Better way is to say, well, we need to find a name. Whenever an intermediate result uh, is important, you should find a name for it. And that takes sweat that, uh, to find a good name for these things. It's not, it's not so, 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 so easy, but uh, it's, it's important. And therefore, it's, I think it's important to keep that in mind that one should invest the time to find these names. So I just took that and I tried to reorganize that, the same expression, but now I broke, out, broke that out into a vowel that I said, well, sources is something where I go over the raw class path. And then I define what my workspace root is, and then I have a function that gives me for every entry the files that correspond to the entry, and then at the end I go through my sources and I take the files of, uh, for each entry and I flatten it all. So now it's sort of halfway understandable. And what's very important here, and what I believe when you come back from a Java background, you don't immediately reach for that, is that Scala makes it so easy to put not just vowels, but also defs in line, right? Whereas in, in Java and in most other languages, it's a big deal, a new method. Well, I have to put that somewhere else in my class. Uh, I have to write a doc comment for it. Uh, I have to write all these modifiers, what it should be, private, uh, final, whatever. Uh, and then uh, there comes this body. So a, a new method is what? 20 lines minimum, something like that, maybe 10. Maybe you can squeeze it in 10. Uh, so people don't usually do it. They write inline code. Or the, the resistance against doing that is much, much higher. And in Scala, it's so easy. Just write the def right uh, where it is, inline, and, and you're done. So note that I wrote a def, let's say, for workspace root. I could have written a val, but I just wanted to stay faithful to the original expression that maybe uh, it could be that the iterator is mostly empty, so you don't want to uselessly compute, let's say, the workspace root when you don't need a, uh, a, uh, a, a file that, that works on it. It might be completely off in this example. I haven't looked at the code too much. It was just how the original one was written. But often it is the case that you say, well, something I don't necessarily want to evaluate that now. And then you have a choice. You can either make it a lazy valve, then it's even cached. Or if uh, it's not a big deal, you just make it a def, and you're done with that. So I think it's so easy to do it, and often it's overlooked. 
because on the other hand, it's so easy to cram a lot of stuff in one huge impressive Scala expression, right? Uh, in that sense, Scala can be used like APL and uh, that, that is uh, quite impressive and it's sometimes tempting because it's like, ah, oh, yeah, this combinator, I just throw it in the same line and I'm done. But for long-term legibility, I don't think it's very good. Number three, prefer functional. So I don't think I should, uh, I, I need to uh, expand much on that. I mean, we all know Scala is a functional language, so look at the side effects, what they could cause, what, what side effects can cause. Prefer functional. So that means, of course, that by default you should always reach for a while, not for a var, reach for recursion or combinator programs, not for loops, uh, use immutable co collections, concentrate on how you transform things rather than create, read, update, delete loops and these sort of things. Um, but on the other hand, Scala is not Haskell, so we are not 100% dogmatic about that. I also fully realize that sometimes it's just, there are also reasons why you want to deviate from that. Sometimes mutable gives you better, better performance. It's undeniable. So if you need that for your code and you have to convince yourself that you need it by, for instance, profiling your application first, then uh, it might be a good fallback to do that. And sometimes, but actually not that often, it also adds convenience. So rather than standing up here and say, never use a var, it's probably good to just look at the cases where I would say, it's okay to use a var. It's don't, don't, don't lose sleep about it. So why are people against state? Uh, what's the problem with state? So the, I think the main problem with state has to do with complexity because state acts essentially as this medium where lots of different parts of your program interact in ways that you don't make explicit. Uh, it's a temporal order of effects. Uh, this guy assigns a variable, this other guy sees the new value. It's not something that's made explicit, let's say, as an input or out output argument of a function. So that's the main reason why it's complicated, why it's complex. And that also means that essentially the, the wider the accessibility of state is, the more problematic it becomes. If state is local to your block or to your method, it's actually not a big deal. So local, local state is actually much, much less harmful than global state. So here's an example where local state might even be preferable. Uh, so here, what I have here, I picked that somewhere from the class file reader, I think. Uh, I say interfaces is a, some parse class header. Uh, and then I say, well, if I find that the thing is an annotation, then implicitly add class file annotation to my interfaces. I can do that, but it's a var. Oh my God, it's a var. I've written a var. Should hide behind. <laughs> well, I should have written. Some people say, or could have written uh, something like this. I could say, well, let's make it a val parsed inter interfaces. Uh, it's parsed class header, and then say interfaces is if it's an annotation, then parsed interfaces plus class file annotation, else simply parsed interfaces. But I mean, guess. This is longer, and it's not necessarily clearer. Longer takes more time to read. So would, do I say, well, do away with that, always use vars? No, I think it comes down pretty much to the second point, and that's a point with naming. So what the functional version here forces me is to invent an auxiliary name for parsed interfaces. And that might be, depending on how my application is structured, something very good that I give this thing a name, or it might be just an annoyance, because in the end, I just want my interfaces, and I don't want to jump through the hoops of uh, lots of different uh, uh, temporary names that I immediately throw away. So I think here, uh, I believe uh, you can have style guides in both directions, uh, but my personal... Uh, tendency would be not to be dogmatic about this, not to lose sleep if somebody writes var in this case. If it's strictly local in, the, in a method, it's quite okay. Here's another example for local, where local state might actually come in handy. Uh, so uh, let's say you have a sequence of items with price and discount attributes, 
and you want to consume the sums of all the prices and discounts. When I go to my grocer, that happens. That will give me total price and how many rebates I got, and that's two different sums there. So, uh, of course, we can write this in line like that, and that's the best way to do it. We can uh, take the items, map the price overall, take the sum, and then do the same thing with the discounts. But let's say because I want to be mean, uh, I want to force you to do the same thing with just one traverser. Maybe I say items is an iterator. You can use it only once afterwards, it's gone. Uh, or I say this thing is huge, I have a huge shopping list and I don't want to traverse it twice. So how, how, you, how would you do that? Well, if you look at the functional toolbox, then I believe the canonical way to do that would be to use a fold. Fold is like the universal tool. You can express basically everything with a fold. So let's use a fold here. So we would say total price and total discounts is a fold left over my items. And then uh, essentially I start with zero and zero. And then I go and uh, I uh, give you back a pair where I add the item price to the total price and the item discount to the total discount. But it's all rather entangled, right? Uh, I wish I had a, do we have a laser point? Oh yeah, we do. So for instance, the initial value zero, zero, they are actually, they thread through this thing here that you say, well, that's where the first are, and then they get threaded through the fold left and then they end up here. Not quite intuitive to see how values flow and how you add them. So if, you, if I compare with the imperative version then, uh, that would be this one here, where I say total price, total discount starts with zero, and then I go through my items and I just add the price to the uh, total price and the discount to the total discount. I believe that's actually something that here would be clearer. So if people say, well, if I have a complex thing, uh, let's say many different, several different quantities, and I want to tie them together with a fold, if somebody picks for a loop instead, I won't condemn that person. I think it's perfectly fine to do that also. Okay, so one thing then, nevertheless, uh, where we sh have to be much more careful than what I told you before were mutable objects. Because a mutable object tends to encapsulate global state, or rather, the state persists for as many different points in my program that can access this object directly or indirectly. And encapsulate sounds good, but it doesn't make the global state go away after all. So it's still a, pot a lot of potential for complex entanglements. So when is an object mutable, you might ask, because that's actually very, very important to get that straight. Uh, so you could say, well, is an object mutable when it if it contains vars? Um, well, not quite. So here's a counterexample. I have my buffer proxy. It takes an array buffer. It has a put method just forwards to the buffer. It has a length method, which is the length of the buffer. So I could say, well, is that object mutable? And I would say, yeah, of course it is. Because uh, after all, it just, it just serves as a front for another object, which is an array buffer. And we all know that that one's a mutable object. So you can't hide by just forwarding to something else. Good, so maybe we should just count mutable structures as vars and be done. Well, it's not so easy. So what about this then? So here we have a class memo, and it takes a function as values, and it has a, uh, a local variable, a local value memo, which is a weak hash map, a mutable weak hash map, and the apply method then does a get or else update on this memo hash map. So it says, well, if it's there, then uh, take the value in the hash map. If it's not there, then use the function that uh, you got provided, uh, the function here, and uh, update your map with that and return the value that you updated it with. So is that a mutable object? What do you think? Mutable? Who thinks it's mutable? Who thinks it's immutable? Okay, so I, yeah, it was a trick question because the answer is it depends. Um, so the correct definition of mutable is that an object is mutable if its functional behavior depends on it, its history. That means the things that I've done before with the objects, the methods I've called before with the object. If that can influence the further behavior of the object, that object is mutable and needs to be handled with care. 
So the question then is, is memo mutable? So if I pass only functions like this one here, pure functions into memo, then uh, the functional behavior doesn't change because after all, what happens is that the second time I call apply on this uh, memo thing here, uh, I will simply get the pre-computed value of the first time I applied the function. And if my function gives me back the same result every time, then that first result is guaranteed to be the same as if I recomputed the fu that function. So if I do that, then in fact this memo object will not depend on its history. Uh, at least the functional behavior doesn't depend on the history, so it is immutable. It might still run much faster the second time that I call it, but that's intended and that doesn't enter into our definition. Okay, but then I have another pro uh, situation here, and now I create a new version of memo with another closure, and that closure actually increments a global counter, so there's my variable, and returns its value. So that second version then, I would argue, is in fact mutable, because if I call it several times, um, then it would, uh, I can observe the behavior. So if I, let's say, call this with uh, a incre simple incrementation function and I apply it the first time, uh, I would get one. If I apply it the second time, I would get, uh, uh, wait, one again. Right, so the, so the uh, have I gotten myself on too thin ice here now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, you could observe the counter, but let's say if the counter was private, uh, then uh, it's, it still should be mutable, right? Uh, oh, yeah. If this function was called from other, other ways as well, it would be mutable. The, 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 main effect, the, the main point is I wanted to illustrate that uh, it really depends on uh, being dependent on the history and the fact that you simply cache functional values from pure computations in an object, even if that object then contains virus or mutable uh, data structures, doesn't make it mutable as an object here. Okay, uh, last suggestion is really a meta suggestion and that's don't stop too early. So uh, I think I've often experienced that I have a problem and I said, well, it's a pretty hard problem and then I write a first solution and then I write a second solution and I'm very pleased with myself because I managed to cut it back in half and the next day I come back and said, well, actually, uh, I can do much better like that. Oops, let me just... Oh. And I find another way to make it even cleaner and four weeks I come back and says, oh, how was I stupid? Uh, this, this can be much better written that way. And that's completely natural. So you might say, well, this is really frustrating. Why can't I have the first factor 10 solution the first day? So I think it's actually, we should see it the other way. It's a great pleasure to be able to go through this exercise to find a better solution multiple times for a piece of code. And I think we should embrace it because it's sort of part of, part of the our intellectual uh, life here and part of essentially growing as a, as a developer and as a programmer. So I think that's really important. And uh, the uh, important thing here is to keep being curious to see how can I improve this thing further? How can I think, make this thing even cleaner and more elegant and simpler? So keep going. Good. So those were the first, the first six suggestions. and. Uh, then I'm going to go through another six, which are essentially choices that one can make, uh, and where, that, where the answer is often it depends on uh, what the precise situation is. And these are, in part, also choices that I grapple myself with. So first choice is um, infix operators versus method calls. So as we know, Scala unifies operators and method calls, so every operator is a method. Every method with at least one parameter can be used as an infix operator. So the question is, how do you choose between the two? So do you write items plus 10 or items dot plus 10? You could do both. Of course, I guess everybody here would agree you write items plus 10. Do you write xs map f or xs dot map f? 
That's actually a good poll. Who writes here XS map F as an infix operator? Okay. And who writes XS dot map F? Okay, that the majority has XS dot map F. Interesting. Um, if we push that further, then we could write, for instance, XS flat map fun filter not is zero group by key FN, or we could use the dot method notation. I think for the first one, again, it's not controversial that I would say this one here is better. Use the dot notation. But for the middle one, when do you go from one to the other? When do you stop using infix operators and go through dot notation? That's actually a, a difficult one. So here I, I actually have changed opinion many times about this. So here I just propose one. You can, and I invite you to disagree with me and to discuss. Uh, we are here for two full days, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear lots of different opinions about this and about also other style questions here. So I think the first rule is pretty simple. If the method is symbolic, then there's no controversy. You will always use in infix. For alphanumeric method names, I believe one can use infix, and I typically do, if there's just one alphanumeric operator in the expression, or where you would, would have put the parents anyway. But as soon as you start chaining, I would actually prefer uh, the infix dot, and I've started to do that slavishly, to just say don't use chained infix, alpha, alpha, alpha infix operators, because they make things pretty hard to read. So I haven't uh, put that on the slide, but imagine you would see just a sequence of words which says mapping, add, filter, map, second, flat, map, third. I was a bit mean here that I used filter as an argument, not as a method name, because the way we key ourselves to say what are methods, what are arguments, is that essentially we pattern match on the method names. But that won't work because you know your methods, but a reader of your program might actually not know that filter is a method, right? So because the, the first reader has to find these things out and will be completely puzzled by what this code is. So that's why I think chaining is important, is, is, is better, chaining with dots is better because it is just much more explicit to say what is what. Choice number two is an uh, old one for the Scala community. So if you've been around, then uh, you know that this thing has been come up before and has been debated viciously. I think viciously is the right word uh, over, over the, the internet and in other forums. So do you pick alphabetic uh, operators or symbolic ones? Uh, so since Scala unifies operators and methods, uh, it says an operator is a method, and since operators tend to be symbolic, uh, so so can methods be. Uh, so it just means they're all different kinds of identifiers, which can be alphanumeric or symbolic. So how do you choose between them? Do you write XS map F for XS? Well, I made that one up. I think it's pretty clear you should write XS map, map, map F. Do you write vector plus matrix or vector add matrix? Again, I would say, well, if it's a plus, uh, something that has a mathematical meaning, you write the plus. No, no doubt about that. That one is a personal uh, favorite because I was really uh, attacked over that one. Do you write XS fold left Z op or Z slash colon XS op? Who writes uh, the left thing here? Yeah, and who writes the right one? Ah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, that, that's sort of the danger in making up new notation because, well, I, I can explain to you why I believe the right notation is vastly superior to the left one. <laughs> I, I actually got, I got uh, uh, yeah, I talked to Sean McDermott uh, uh, last week and he said he was always confused by fold left because he thought fold left, it goes from right to left. But no, it goes from left, le from left to right. So he thought fold left was, so fold right is the right one, and fold left is just the wrong one, so with, by which he meant fold right. So very confusing. Whereas here, uh, the, the best explanation for this funny operator is falling dominoes. Uh, so you say, well, think of a domino thing. So it's a sequence of things, and you have an initial one, and then it drrr, they all fall. So that's what this thing does here, right? You have the first value here, and then it all goes over there. 
And, and the other thing, by the way, which makes this much nicer is that if you visualize these things as a tree, as an operator tree, then, of course, the, the, the initial element, the Z, is on the leftmost edge of it, and it is here in the infix operator, whereas in the fold left operator, it's actually to the right of the list, which is completely wrong. It's, it's, it's the other way around. So these are all the great reasons why I think you should write it that way. But you all disagree with me. Nobody writes it that way, and that shows that in the end, I think I was wrong. Uh, you can't, you shouldn't go up again against overwhelming convention, and you, you have to be very, very careful with these new symbolic operators. Uh, a last one where I had much more luck, in fact, than uh, with fold left was uh, triple question mark. That was a win, uh, so everybody likes triple question mark, I think. And people, af after the uh, symbolic operator debate, they were very, very skeptical. They said, oh, this was this disaster with whatnot. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, you should use undefined or something like that. Don't, don't do new symbolic operators. But it actually turned out that triple question mark is, uh, is a favorite of uh, all the programmers out there. So what uh, lesson can we draw from that? I think one should use symbolic only if the meaning is understood by your target audience and the operator is standard in an application domain. Or maybe you would like to draw attention to the operator. You would sort of say, well, this is really cool and I have a good reason why it should be that operator and I have a story. Uh, because after all, it's the symbolic operators typically stick out more than alphanumeric ones because alpha, you have a lot of words in your program, but if you have a new symbol, you say, well, what is that? And I believe that triple question mark it was the ideal thing because it sort of was intuitively understood and it definitely draws attention to the thing that you're supposed to fill in, rather much more than a word like undefined could do. Uh, but it seems the same... Uh, the same margin of success didn't apply to my slash colon operator. Well, maybe afterwards uh, you all change your mind and, and we'll, we'll have some late success. But anyway, so go, go very careful on that one. Um, number three, loop recursion or combinators. So often for some piece of functionality, one could use a loop like this one here so that... Uh, uh, essentially looks at the first occurrence of something in, in a sequence that uh, 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 qualifies according to some predicate. Or you could use a recursion. So you have here a function that does the same thing. Or you could use uh, predefined combinators. So here's the uh, predefined combinator that would do that would be to say you go from zero to length, you find the element that qualifies, and then you that gives you back an option, so you get that, or else uh, if uh, uh, the element is not found, you want to return the length of the sequence that you looked at according to the thing. So which of those three do you choose? That, that one is rather tricky, and I guess different people would choose different uh, uh, ways to express that. That's not the only example I have. So here's another one. It says map f. Would you write that? Or this one here does the same thing. Or maybe this one here does the same thing. Ah, that was a trick question, right? Of course you would use XS map f, pretty clear. Uh, so here's another one. Um, what does that thing do? Well, maybe I throw up the other ones, uh, the other examples as well. Um, so what that thing does is it um, produces uh, the products of adjacent elements in the list. So it takes the first element and the second produces its product, takes the third and the fourth produces its product and so on in a new list. And here again you have the combinator version, the loop version and the uh, recursive version here. And uh, I believe there actually it's not quite that clear yet uh, again what to do. Well, one thing is clear that I believe the, the loop is the worst. You won't... You, you probably should never or hardly ever write a loop in these cases. But for the other tools, it's actually not so simple. So if you know your combinators, if you have grouped, and uh, well, everybody has mapped, but grouped is something that you, maybe you, you didn't know and you didn't know it, did, it only existed on iterators and not on other sequences, it maybe didn't come to you that readily. And uh, furthermore, uh, 
if your team doesn't know the combinators, then again, uh, that's a problem because th this, this thing might be quite incomprehensible for your coworkers. So with that caveat, this is a very nice solution, but you really need to know the combinators. If not, then I believe that even though this is longer, it's much easier to grasp for the new newcomers. You say, well, you go through the list, and then obviously there's something I do with the first two elements. That's my, what my pattern match does. So what do I do? Well, I multiply them, and then I go on with the rest of the list. It's pretty clear what this thing does for even a casual observer. Um, so the third solution is easier to grasp for newcomers, and also if efficiency is a, is a concern, then Sometimes the combinator version will produce lots of intermediate data structures that take time. So uh, typically, a tail recursive, so recursive, uh, a tail recursive solution is faster than, uh, or at least as fast and often faster than the combinator solution. And it's of, often overlooked. So I find with programmers often they, well, sometimes they're stuck in the loop, and or they, they are insistent on proving a combinator, on, on finding a combinator solution, but actually they want to just say, well, if it's too hard, just fall back to a simply pattern match and recursion. Uh, that's a, a very easy way out, and one that often is actually overlooked, and I think it's perfectly acceptable in many situations. So you could ask, well, why does Scala have all these puzzling choices? Um, well, combinators, they're done in the library, so in a sense it's not a fault of the language, but of course, they're also the easiest to use. Recursive functions are the bedrock of functional programming. You couldn't do anything without them. Pattern matching is, of course, much clearer and safer than, than the tests and, and selections. And loops, well, loops is probably the toughest one. Uh, I guess the main reason is because they're familiar and uh, sometimes they're sim they're the simplest solutions. But if you were forcing me to throw out one of the three, then I guess I would throw out the loops, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, they are sort of the solutions that I believe you would use le the least often. So recommendation, I guess one always use, tries to use combinators first. Uh, if they, you have the right set of combinators to do what you want to do, it's definitely the cleanest and safest way to get where you want to be. Uh, if this becomes too tedious because you have to do too many mental uh, uh, loopings to get there, then or efficiency is a big concern, then fall back on tail recursive functions and use loops only in real simple cases or when the computation inherently modifies state, then it might still be the best way to do it. Good. Um, number four, procedures or equals. So Scala has a special syntax for unit returning procedures. Uh, so you can, for instance, write something like swap. It takes an array and two elements, and it would... Uh, then, where's my, okay. And then you can simply, as you know, follow it with braces and then you have the code there. Or of course you could use something that uh, is the more standard style for all the other methods. You could uh, take the, uh, give it a return type of unit and use an equals there. So which would you choose? Actually the official semi-official Scala style guide says you should use uh, this one here. And I believe the IntelliJ uh, syntax checker also enforces you or says you should this one, use this one here. Um, why Scala has both? I actually believe it's a historical accident. Uh, initially, when we did Scala, I was really um, extremely concerned about not losing Java programmers over the first hurdles they they had to take in this strange new language. And the, one of my, the first concerns was, well, we had the first programming examples that we explained to them, like a sorting routine. And the sorting routine is recursive, so you have to test to have a return type. And then you had to write sort colon unit equals. And I said, oh my god, how do you explain unit to a Java programmer? It's, uh, they, they, it will be the first thing where I'm going to lose them because they're so used to void. And then I have to go into all these details to say how unit is not quite like void and things like that. And it's just not a point I wanted to make. So that's why, unfortunately, I... Uh, invented this, this uh, notation uh, of the procedure syntax, which in retrospect I think was actually a big mistake. Uh, because uh, not only 
uh, increases it, the irregularity of the language, but it also opens up a really bad trap that you'll want to write something like that. And that actually would be, uh, well, it will give you a syntax error, but sort of what the parser thinks you're writing here is a refinement type. It says, well, this is colon unit, and then I do some additional definitions on my unit, and then the equals is missing, so my bo the function doesn't have a body. It's an abstract function with a weird type, and then I would get some error that it says, well, this is not a, this is not a legal beginning of a type. And the user used to say, what? Uh, Nowadays, things are much better. We really put a lot of engineering in the compiler to give you nicer error messages, and it, it's a huge hassle, but it wouldn't have been necessary if I just had been a little bit more prudent uh, early on in the language design. So my recommendation is don't use procedure syntax. It just uh, was a bad idea from the start, and I think we probably are going to deprecate it at some point. So uh, don't, don't do more of that uh, now. So that was an easy one. Um, here's a trickier one that was actually Jason uh, Sauk who brought that to my attention. Private versus nested. So in Java, when you want to make something private, well, you write private, and that's the only way you can have any definitions that you hide. In Scala, you actually have two choices. You can uh, make it private, or you can put it inside another method. Of course, that only works when the private entity method is only used from inside a single method, not several ones. But let's assume that's the case. So you have two choices. Which one do you pick? So here's one possibility. Uh, so you say, I have some outer method, and here I have uh, an inner one called is Java, and uh, here I, I use it. So do you write it inline like that, or do you write it uh, as a private method like that. So I could here write is Java here and a method like that. Which one would you pick here? Does it say parameters by not having the parameters? Good point, yeah. Here it doesn't. So here is Java is a method that doesn't actually capture any parameters. What are the odds that you actually have a chance to use that? Sorry? What are the odds that maybe you want to use that thing later would be the other? From somewhere else, yeah, yeah. So uh, True. That's, that's another point. So, so let's assume we are pretty sure we won't need it anywhere else and it doesn't capture any parameters. <laughs> that it's, yeah. So definitely if it captures parameters, then uh, there's, there's no, uh, no doubt what, what, what you should do. So, so let's, let's say if my is Java method actually would go to the owner here and, and use, some, use something with the owner, then if I would pull it out as a private method, I would have to parameterize it with this additional symbol. And that's something that I don't want to do. So I want to save parameters. Less parameters is all, always better. So that's clear. If you do not capture anything, then actually you have a choice because uh, then the fact that you don't capture anything is something that is actually important, again, for, to read the program. You say, well, I don't capture. The function is Java doesn't need anything in this, its immediate environment. So if I still write it in that environment, I have to do some mental parsing. I have to go through this method and say, well, it doesn't capture anything. It's okay. And if the method is short, like this one, I think that's also fully okay. But if it's long, it could be a problem. I often see code, a long, sequ a long method, 10 lines, 15 lines, or something like that, and it's inside some other method and says, well, does it have to be there, or could I move it out? Maybe I want to make it usable for something else, but I don't know, not by just looking at the code. So my recommendation would be definitely, if you can save on the parameters, prefer the nesting. Also prefer the nesting for small functions, like one line, two lines, even if nothing is captured, because that's very easy to parse what it, what it takes, and you don't want to compute, pollute your larger namespace, but don't nest too many levels deep. So if you nest over three or four levels, that, that often becomes very difficult to actually mentally parse then what it is. Last choice. Uh, that actually brings us a little bit back to the first uh, 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 slides on object-oriented versus uh, uh, classical programming, uh, pattern matching versus dynamic dispatch. That's one that always also is, is always a thing that often people go back and forth on that. So here you have a hierarchy of shapes, uh, a class shape and some subshapes, a circle and a rectangle and a point, and you want to write a method to compute the area of these shapes. How do you do that? 
Well, one way to do it would be to do a, a pattern match. Uh, so you have a single method area, and it does a match on uh, all the different shapes that you do. Uh, the other possibility would be to actually put the, an abstract area method into the base class, and then to put uh, the a concrete one into each of the subclasses that overrides the abstract one. So which one do you choose? Do you choose the object-oriented way to do essentially dynamic binding, dynamic dispatch, or do you choose pattern matching? Yeah, that's right. So it comes down to the expression problem. Uh, so, and the expression problem has to do with extensibility. So uh, first, why Scala has both? So pattern matching is essentially the functional heritage and it is extremely convenient in a lot of cases, definitely if you work with lists and if you work with many other things as well. And dynamic dispatch is uh, the core mechanism for extensible systems, so that's why you have both. But for instance, it's a big uh, question that we face in the Scala compiler all the time. Do you write a, a single method that does a pattern match over all the possible kinds of types or trees that you uh, are dealing with, or do you put these methods into the individual types of trees? So the recommendation would here would be that it really depends whether your system should be extensible uh, or not. If you foresee extensions with new data alternatives, then you are essentially forced to use uh, the object-oriented method. That's why object-oriented programming was invented after all. It was invented for that, to essentially give you new, uh, the ability to add new alternatives to your data. If you foresee rather adding new methods later, then again, it's a no-brainer. You don't want to add these methods every time into all the different classes that you have. You want to concentrate the methods. You want to use the pattern matching version. If your system is complex and closed, then I believe you should also use the pattern matching version. And that has to do a little bit with uh, spaghetti code because in the end, uh, a lot of overriding of methods in many different base classes is a symptom of spaghetti code. That means that your uh, thread of control is very non-local. Uh, you have uh, a call and then it very much depends on the actual runtime type where you will actually end up with. It's very hard to track and you might easily overlook a, a possible implementation that might violate all the assumptions that you have, uh, have about your methods. If they're all in one place and you, you do pattern matching on that, it's actually much, much simpler. So I uh, uh, had, had been involved in the Scala compiler, and I must say I, I did a gradual shift to say uh, from uh, sort of a mixture of object oriented and pattern match, and no nowadays I write much more the pattern matching kind than, than the object oriented kind for that. So what if you want to extend in both dimensions? That's actually a tricky one. Uh, so one way to do it, uh, you could do it, would be to have essentially combine a pattern match and an inheritance. So you could have a shape handler class that has an area method, so put the method in the class. And then if you have some extra shapes later, you can actually have a subclass of that without changing the code. And you can have a new area method that handles the new cases, like here, a triangle. And if it's any of the old cases, it can actually forward to them. That's the question what to do if you extend the system in both dimensions has been famously known as the expression problem. And it's actually called expression problem because the categorical example where expression trees, so the trees of a compiler that where you might want to add new kinds of trees, new kinds of expressions, or you might want to add new operations that you work on these, that, that work on these expressions. So, um, we are at the end of the talk. Um, I guess I have shown you lots of choices that maybe left you puzzling. Uh, and that's, in a sense, natural, because uh, I believe this confluence of uh, object-oriented, imperative, and functional breaks a lot of new ground. People haven't really done that before a lot, and it means that a lot of new conventions will have to be formed, and I think are about to be formed. My main advice, if I should just give you these, is to keep things simple. Uh, try to find good names for these. That's essentially half the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, success already. And have fun. Have fun in uh, writing code, in improving yourself, in trying to find better ways to do the same things. Thank you.
So, so now comes the fun part. Uh, I believe we're going to have uh, more drinks and. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, and there's going to be some music, as Sushila said, and I'm looking forward to mingle you, with you and uh, discuss all the outrageous things that I've said now in the talk, and you can prove me wrong and, uh, and propose to me other solutions. Thanks.